I want to begin by thanking each and every one of you for being here and thanking the organizers of this uh, 49th uh, Calgary Leadership Prayer Breakfast for, for giving me a chance to speak. Uh, many of you have been at these breakfasts before, but for some of you this is the first time and you may even feel a little bit of trepidation about uh, attending a, a prayer breakfast, <clears throat> but uh, I want to remind us that uh, human beings have been praying since the dawn of time. Uh, it's actually, we're participating in one of the oldest practices and institutions of mankind, and it's nothing to be embarrassed about or apologetic about or apprehensive about. So if you're here for the first time, particularly want to welcome you. I'm glad to see that there are students here. There has been a controversy of whether you should have prayer in the schools, but uh, my observation is as long as there have been fin uh, final exams, there will always be prayer <laughs> in, in the school. <clears throat> now, now by, by way of full disclosure, I should tell you that I have a Baptist background, and, and Baptists are capable of having very strong opinions. Uh, for example, there's a story in the old days of the West that there was a two Baptist families that met in the one-room schoolhouse near their homestead every Sunday, and one day they got into this discussion on what would you do if outlaws showed up at your cabin and you had hidden your wife and your children in the cellar uh, for safety, and what would you do if the outlaws asked, where are your wife and children? Should you tell them the truth and endanger them, or should you lie to protect them? And of course, by next Sunday, there were now two small Baptist churches in the community. Uh, the, the lying Baptist and the truthful Baptist. <laughs> now, since I've been involved in politics, you might suspect that I come from the one church, but uh, I actually want to tell you that <coughs> I'm in the truthful Baptist tradition. <clears throat> now, 2017 is Canada's uh, 150th anniversary as a country. And it's therefore an appropriate time to remember our heritage, including our spiritual heritage. So what I'd like to do this morning is to discuss with you and present to you uh, briefly some of Calgary's spiritual heritage and draw some conclusions from it, which I hope will be helpful and useful to you. The stories I'll be telling are drawn mainly from the Protestant tradition, with which I'm most familiar, but hopefully they'll resonate with you uh, and be relevant to your lives, whatever your personal background or your beliefs may be. Let me start by referencing two great streams that cut across the Canadian prairies, and particularly in the first part of the, of the last century, like the North and South Saskatchewan rivers. Uh, the evangelical stream and the social gospel stream. According to the social gospel perspective, the primary purpose of the Christian religion is to heal and strengthen relationships among people to resolve conflicts among people, to achieve social justice and social peace. The Jesus story that most appeals to the social gospel tradition is that story of Nicodemus, that, uh, or the story of the Good Samaritan that was, uh, was read today. I could comment that the Good Samaritan actually made a private payment for health care, which would be illegal under the... <laughs> 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 that, 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 that would be getting into politics. I'm supposed to stay away from that. <laughs> According to evangelicals, the other stream, and I come from that tradition, the primary purpose of the Christian faith is to reconcile a sinful individuals to a righteous God, to reconcile conflicts between man and God, and to achieve personal salvation and personal peace. The favorite New Testament passage of evangelicals is that one that was read this morning from the story of Nicodemus, who was told by Jesus that he had to be born again spiritually from within in order to, to live or work in the kingdom of God. Now here in Calgary in the 1920s and, and 30s, one of the most prominent proponents of the evangelical perspective was the distinguished principal of Crescent Heights High School, William Aberhart. Is anybody here from Crescent Heights High School? Crescent Heights High School, that's got a great tradition. Aberhart pioneered not only religious radio broadcasting, but political radio broadcasting in the West over the old CFCN, Voice of the Prairies radio station. In the 1920s, he opened a training school for ministers on 8th Avenue between 4th and 5th Street Southwest. There's a, uh, uh, it, that's the Holt Renfrew building now, and there's a, there's a picture there of the old institute building in that uh, window. And uh, with money that he raised from his radio listeners. My father, Ernest Manning, was raised on a homestead in Saskatchewan 
I heard one of Eberhardt's early radio broadcasts over a crystal radio set that he and his brother had put together and enrolled as a student at that uh, institute. As the Great Depression of the 1930s uh, deepened and uh, Western Canada was caught not only in, in the financial depression but uh, a drought that virtually ruined Alberta's uh, agricultural economy, Eberhardt added a social dimension to his institute by opening a soup kitchen for the unemployed. And there he began to see in these long lines of young people lining up at his soup kitchen. They were, they were riding the rails at the CPR and they used to jump off the trains uh, near his uh, soup kitchen in order to avoid the CPR police. He started to see in those lines young people that he had sent off to be teachers and lawyers and, uh, and professionals and so forth, uh, just riding the rails from Vancouver to Winnipeg looking vainly for work. This experience compelled Eberhardt to search for the causes of depression and led him to found a political party, the Social Credit Party, which contested and won the 1935 provincial election. So Eberhardt, the evangelical layman and educator, reluctantly became uh, Alberta's seventh uh, premier. And my father, who'd come to Alberta to become a minister of the uh, gospel, ended up running in that election, getting elected to the legislature, and becoming a minister of the crown. Uh, when Eberhardt died in 1943, my father succeeded him as premier and served in that office until 1968 and also carried on the radio broadcast that, that William Eberhardt had started. And so I was raised in a, a political home and a religious home uh, where I was taught that you had to make a decision at some point as to whether to follow Jesus of Nazareth or not. Follow me in particular by admitting that there was sin in your life that kept you from a relationship with God by believing that Jesus had come to mediate that conflict between yourself and God and through his sacrificial life and death and by accepting Jesus as your personal reconciler and savior. As a teenager, and so we're glad that there are teenagers here this morning, I went through a period of trying to decide whether this something was something I wanted to do or whether it was something I was being pressured into being done by my family or by my church. And in the end, I decided it really was something that I wanted to do and did so, asking Jesus into my life as my personal reconciler. Now, I tell you this story as part of my own spiritual heritage, but also because this evangelical perspective is a part of the broader spiritual heritage of Calgary and Alberta. And it raises the question, is it a heritage that should be ignored and abandoned? Is it just something from the past? And should it be kept in the past? Or should it be reconsidered and, and revived as still relevant today to people who are suffering from inner fears, inner anxieties, and a multitude of insecurities, ultimately rooted from the evangelical perspective in our separation from God as the ultimate source of our being? I put the question to you, have you ever considered the need to seek a personal relationship to God through what Jesus said and taught? Or should you? And it's a question I'll return to in a minute. Now, hurrying on, J.S. Woodsworth was a Methodist minister based in Winnipeg. Winnipeg. We have a, uh, an MLA from uh, Manitoba here this morning. And Woodsworth was a minister at a time of great social and economic upheaval after the First World War. Winnipeg was the scene of the Great Winnipeg Strike in 1919, which turned violent. They used the military to put it down. So a major political disruption in, Winnipeg, in Manitoba's history. During this time, Woodsworth left the Methodist Church over its emphasis on individual salvation, while neglecting, in his judgment, the deplorable social and economic circumstances in which many of those individuals lived. He became one of the foremost proponents of the social gospel, that the essence of the Christian faith was on establishing right relationships among people or social justice. Uh, sometime later, like Eberhardt in Alberta, and together with Tommy Douglas, a Baptist minister from Saskatchewan, Woodsworth helped to form a political party. Part of the, the history of Western Canada has got faith and politics all mixed up together. We can, it's a feature of our, our politics that you can't deny. You can try to sort it out. And Woodsworth helped to form a, a political party, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation of the CCF, which is the predecessor party to the New Democratic Party today. Although the initial platform of that party was proclaimed as the Regina uh, Manifesto in Regina, Saskatchewan, guess where the founding convention of that party was held? Here in Calgary in 1932. It's part of our political heritage. 
So I tell you this social gospel story because it too is an important part of the spiritual heritage of Calgary and Western Canada. And it raises the question, is it a heritage? It should be uh, ignored and abandoned as something in the past, or should it be reconsidered and revived as relevant to people and social conditions today? Have you ever considered the need to investigate what the life and words of Jesus have to teach about our personal and collective obligations from a spiritual perspective to the injured neighbor by the side of the road? Should our social services and charitable activities include a spiritual dimension and motivation? Or is it pure, is purely a, a humanistic motivation sufficient to guide and empower our provision of services to the poor or the sick or the oppressed? Again, relevant questions arising out of our spiritual heritage as Calgarians and Western Canadians. Now, commentators have pointed out, if you put the vertical shaft of your personal spiritual well-being together with the horizontal crossbar of social services, what have you got? You've got the cross, the great symbol of the Christian faith writ, writ large. And a reminder that Jesus of Nazareth came to teach and practice and achieve reconciliation in both dimensions. Now, so what is the, uh, you've been very patient listening to this historical, I, I think we've got to spend more time figuring out what our history is. I, I think people who don't know where they come from don't know where they are and don't know where they're going. So that's why I spend time on the historical aspect. But what is the relevance and application of these important aspects of our heritage for us today? Let me identify three uh, challenges which these perspectives present. First, if we come from or identify in some way with the evangelical tradition, could it be that we need to more conscientiously add the crossbar of social service and social justice to that perspective? Uh, heaven knows there's enough work to be done in that area as we are long past the point where reliance solely on governments and agencies of the welfare state is sufficient to adequately address the needs of the poor, the oppressed, the sick, the homeless, and the addicted in the city of Calgary or in Alberta. Perhaps this morning we evangelicals need to pray, Heavenly Father, show me specific individuals or groups by the side of the road who have been physically or socially or economically injured, people with whom you, God, would have me share my time, my resources, my ability to help, and my own dependence on you. I should say that part of my own maturing in the Christian faith <laughs> has been adding this horizontal dimension to the vertical shaft of my evangelical upbringing. I've come to believe, as Jesus taught, that God is at work in the world, and we don't see it very often, but God is at work in the world, reconciling people to himself and to each other in a unique way, in the way that Jesus taught, in resolving conflicts and the suffering that arises from conflict, uh, not by the application of law and judgment and going to court, by positioning mediators after the example of Jesus who identify with both sides of the conflict, who communicate with both sides, and who are willing themselves to bear the cost and pay the price of bringing the conflicted parties together rather than demanding that that price be paid by the offended party. That's the unique Jesus approach to conflict resolution. It is fundamentally different than trying to solve things through the courts. It's an out-of-court settlement. Uh, but it's a profound, it's a profound uh, approach to conflict, uh, to, to conflict resolution. Now, there's an opportunity to practice that approach in the political arena, because at the end of the day, democratic governance is all about the reconciliation of conflicting interests by non-coercive means. And as a management consultant in the 1970s and 80s, I became particularly involved in trying to resolve conflicts between oil companies and indigenous people applying this Jesus way, suitably disguised, of course, so as not to unduly alarm my secular clients and, and friends. <laughs> now is not the time to get into that in any detailed way, but let, let me tell you one adventure we had, at reconciliation in the oil patch that is, is actually humorous as well as instructive. One of our clients had a heavy oil pilot plant in north central Alberta near an indigenous uh, band of 3,000 members. Relations between the company and the band were becoming tense and the company decided they needed to hire someone to try and reconcile the conflicts and the differences between them. The man in charge of this uh, process was a hard 
spoiled petroleum engineer. I, I actually really admired uh, the guy. I'll, I'll call him Joe. It's not his real name. Some of you here might recognize his name if I were to give it. <laughs> uh, and I greatly respected him except for one trait. He swore like a trooper <laughs> and at almost any provocation and his most frequent utterance on those occasions was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He would interrupt our meetings with that. Joe asked a number of us, including the legal department and the public affairs department of his company, to put forward our suggestions as to what type of person should we should be looking for to play this mediatorial role between the company and the band. I suggested someone who incorporates the perspectives of both sides, someone who has lived in both and can live in both worlds, and who will be given or has the resources to, uh, uh, to uh, cover the, entirely the cost of bringing the company and the band together. And I actually had someone in mind, a, a Métis businessman who lived in that community, who's done business with the co company for years, but who hunted and fished and lived with the members of the band. Eventually the day came when Joe announced in his usually colorful manner uh, his decision. And he said something like this. He says, the legal department, the legal beagles want me to hire a lawyer of some sort who is familiar with the treaty rights of the band, who knows what our legal obligations are under contracts and can handle this dispute if it gets into court. He said, the PR people want me to hire a pretty face who will look good on television if and when we get into a dispute explaining our side of the picture. And Manning here, and he paused for effect, Manning here wants me to hire Jesus Christ. <laughs> Someone else who must have had a biblical background suggested, so maybe we should take the candidates down to the Athabasca River and the first one that can walk a talk across in the top of the <laughs> It was all said in jest, but I found it significant that somehow that hard-boiled petroleum engineer seemed to recognize in the job description someone who incorporates the perspectives of both sides, someone who can live and operate in both worlds, someone who could and would bear the responsibilities and costs of bringing the parties together a likeness to Jesus Christ. Joe was actually a lot closer to uh, the, one of the keys to reconciliation uh, than perhaps he knew. But let me hurry on. Perhaps you come from or identify with the, uh, in some way with the social gospel tradition or its equivalence in, in the work of, of civil society organizations or, or government organizations. Could it be that you need to add to your life that vertical shaft of a personal relationship with our Creator? so that you can draw wisdom and inner strength from him in your own life and in your reconciling work. Perhaps you need to pray, Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I have no such relationship with you, that I and most of those I work with are separated from you by things in our lives and our society of which you would not approve. But Father, I'm willing to believe you sent Jesus as the mediator to reconcile me and to you and to believe that somehow, somehow, you don't have to understand it all, somehow his sacrificial life and death makes that reconciliation possible. I accept him today as my personal reconciler. Why might we feel the necessity of praying such a prayer? Two, two reasons. First, because if we're honest, we may well be feeling the necessity of an inner spiritual transformation to meet deep needs for healing and conflict resolution within our own lives and in, within the lives of our own families. How can we resolve conflicts and suffering among others in society? if we're internally conflicted and internally unresolved ourselves. But secondly, perhaps we want to pray this prayer because we're feeling that the needs for healing and conflict resolution in our city are so numerous and so vast that we need resources to cope with them beyond what we can provide in our own strength or beyond what we can demand from governments. These are the kinds of feelings that drove many of the people of this city and this province to seek a stronger personal relationship with God during the Depression. We've seen the stress created on many of our fellow Calgarians and the social services of this city and the province when the economy of this uh, province is contracted by 2 to 3 percent due to low oil prices. Can you imagine the stress and despair that was created when Alberta's provincial income fell by 56% as it did in the Depression. I think of my mother, Muriel Manning, 
She was the single child of a single mother, a Protestant child raised in Catholic residential schools first in a convent in Prince Albert and later at the Sacred Heart Convent here in Calgary. She said it was a disciplined upbringing with harsh aspects in some respects, but one of the great things which she was eternally grateful for was that the sisters taught her to play the piano so well that she graduated from the Toronto Conservatory of Music and was a concert, accredited concert pianist by the age of 16. Eberhard heard her play the organ or the piano at some public event and was so impressed by her that he, became, he asked her to become the musical director of, of his institute. In the midst of the depression, when there were virtually no government safety nets, it was the churches and institutions like that institution that sent their people out to do what they could to alleviate the suffering created by mass unemployment and the destruction of the agricultural economy. My mother told stories of visiting farms within a few miles of Calgary here, where the only meat they had to eat was gopher stew and where the children were clad in the burlap, the burlap that you used to get binder twine in. By that time, my father was a minister in the provincial government, which was in desperate financial state itself. In 1938, the budget of this province was $17 million, $9 million of it committed to debt service. So you tried to run the government of Alberta on $8 million. There wasn't enough to meet the civil service payroll. They used to calculate what would come in. He used to meet with Keith Huckvale, who ended up becoming the provincial auditor here. They meet at the end of the month to see how much cash came in, ma mainly from sales taxes, because you couldn't collect any other kind of taxes. And they would prorate the salary of the civil servants. So if two thirds of the so called revenue came in, you got two thirds of your pay, but nobody quit because there was no other job to take. In, in uh, 1938, the province had defaulted on its interest payments on its debt. And then that meant it couldn't borrow to fund essential services. Alberta was flat on her back, and there were people suffering like we've never seen in our generation. And the needs were so overwhelming that those involved in meeting them exhausted themselves and the few resources they had. No wonder they came to the conclusion that they needed aid beyond their own, divine aid, if there was such a thing, and a personal relationship with God if there was such a thing to sustain their own morale and ability under circumstances like that to keep serving others in need. Now conditions today are not so drastic, yet the social needs of this city are still daunting. The increasing numbers at the food banks, the increasing numbers of homeless people that you see on the street every day, the increasing numbers of people addicted to alcohol and pornography and, and now barbiturates, the list goes on and on. So perhaps if we're here this morning, and our concerns, religious or otherwise, have been primarily focused on this horizontal dimension, uh, how to meet the overwhelming economic and social needs that abound about us, maybe what we need to add to our lives is that vertical shaft of a personal relationship with a Father God which Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about, a God who cares, a God who loves, and a God who gives beyond measure to those who seek his aid. Now, in closing, uh, I think by now you have the idea that I'm a big fan of Jesus of Nazareth and of his life and teachings. If I'd been around in his day and he'd agreed to become politically involved, as he was urged to do, to become the honorable member from Galilee and lead a revolt against Caesar's taxes, <laughs> don't, don't get me off on that subject, I would have happily volunteered to have been his campaign manager. I admire him n not, not simply because of his, his whole spiritual ministry and role, but for his astounding impact uh, of his very short public life on people through the ages. I know of no other person in history, and I've read a lot of history, whose public life lasted only 36 months. But 2,000 years later, there's over a billion people who profess to be guided in some way, shape, or form by his teachings. Some of us are involved, some in this room are involved in trying to create a political public movement in this country. Worked at it for 20, for 25 years. We got a membership up to 200,000, <laughs> something like that. We got six and a half million votes a couple of times. And 25 years from now, everybody forget about it. Th this person, public career lasted only 36 months. 2,000 years later, over a billion people uh, profess to be guided in some way by his teachings. And wh wh what a person. One of the keys, I believe, to his lasting influence, and certainly his influence in my life, is that he ended almost all his discourses, public and private, 
with an appeal, e either direct or indirect, for people to do something. He once rebuked his own initial followers. He said, why do you call me master and teacher and do not the things that I say? I think if he came back today in a, in a tangible, real person, he'd say to a lot of nations and people that commit, profess to be Christian in some ways, why do you call yourselves Christian and do not the things that I say? He, he wanted people to do something. He didn't engage with Nicodemus simply for the purpose of having a theological debate with a religious leader. In the end, he asked him to do something, to believe that he, a religious leader, would experience a spiritual new birth and could experience a new birth that would radically change and empower his relationships with God and with others. Jesus did not tell the story of the Good Samaritan to merely stimulate endless discussion on what should we do about the poor and, and the injured. He, he didn't do it in order to create another buzz on the Jerusalem talk show. Uh, he didn't conclude it by urging his hearers to just write about it or talk about it or blog about it or tweet about it. He urges his hearers to go and do something to help someone in need. Go and do. So in that spirit, and with that example before us, let us resolve to leave this prayer breakfast together to do something. To rediscover and recover the spiritual heritage of this city. To add the crossbar of social action to our vertical shaft if we're evangelically inclined. To add the vertical shaft of a personal relationship with Jesus to our social action crossbar if we're social justice inclined. And whatever our perspective may be, to pray daily as he taught us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done in Canada, in Alberta, in Calgary, and in our own lives. May God bless you all. Thank you.